Morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? I wanted to start by wishing everyone a happy Father's Day. So happy Father's Day. And all the other fathers here present, happy Father's Day. And to all the fathers to be, happy Father's Day. to be, yes. Um, this morning, we're going to start by asking ourselves some questions. The title of uh, this lesson this morning is Grace and the Spiritually Maturing Believer. So uh, we have to ask ourselves, how does God's grace relate to a, a believer that wants to mature and desires to mature in the study of God's word and the living out of God's grace? So here's some questions we'll ask ourselves. Um, we start with, where does the grace we have come from? Who can give us this grace? What should we do with this grace? How do we respond to grace? And what benefits does grace give us? We're going to start this morning, if everyone can turn with me to the book of John in the New Testament. We're going to start with the first chapter of John. So I'll give you all a moment to get there. We'll be reading... I'll be reading out loud for everyone to follow along as verses 1 through 18. And this is a very familiar passage for everyone, uh, but so, there's some exciting things in there that we can learn from it. And especially if you're new believers here or haven't uh, heard who the Lord is. So we'll start with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness that he might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. There was the true light, which come, come into the world, it enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, born not of blood, nor of the will of, fle of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the, as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So there, in this passage, let's look at verse 17 a little bit more closely. And I'll reread it for everyone out loud. For the law was given through Moses, but it says grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Um, here the Apostle John states that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But now let's back up and go to verse 16. For it states, for of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Notice, for of his fullness we have all received. When we go to the Greek Dictionary of the New Testament and to the Vines Expository Dictionary, we find it is used of the grace and truth manifested in Christ of all of his virtues and excellencies. This same word fullness, the Apostle Paul uses in Ephesians 4.13, and I'll read that for everyone. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So there's our, one of our keywords is fullness, and it pertains to Christ. 
But then also let's take note of uh, grace upon grace, that statement. What does that mean in verse 16? This is actually a double term found in the book of Exodus, chapters 32 through 43. This is where Moses and the people had received grace, but they were in trem tremendous need of more grace. You can read Exodus, Exodus 33, 13 later to understand more fully. But for now, let's look at the Nelson Study Bible note, and I'll read that out loud. Grace is God's favor expressed as sinful humankind apart from any human works or worth. Though there was abundant grace and truth expressed by God through the law he gave Moses, it is in the person of Jesus Christ that grace and truth are realized to the fullest. And then also I, in my research, I was reading a Tony Evans study Bible and I also really enjoyed his notes on this. He said, when we receive the substitutionary atoning death of Christ on the cross, our sins are forgiven and eternal life is imparted. That is amazing grace. The gospel then does what the law could not do. Through Jesus, we have access to the unmerited and unlimited favor of God. Grace is the inexhaustible supply of God's goodness that continuously brings his favor to his people doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. God will provide believers with a never-ending supply of grace upon grace through Christ. And then also we look towards the Apostle Paul to learn more about this grace. In his final letter to his beloved son in the faith, uh, that son being Timothy, this tells us more so we can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm going to start with verse 1. Paul states to Timothy, You, therefore, my beloved, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Can we as fathers now, or who may become fathers, have a close enough relationship with Jesus Christ um, to teach our children where God's grace is found in the scriptures? Yes, How they can receive his grace freely. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, not 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And of course, verse 9, equally as important, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. Now the question, a maturing believer in this grace freely given by God. A maturing believer will grow in being concerned with how their children can experience God in the scriptures, how they can become children of God. Let's turn back to the book of John, chapter 1, verse 12. I'll read it, but this time I read a little bit slower and focus in on it. It's verse 12. Now, this is speaking about uh, how fathers can share the truth of God's word with their sons. He says, But as many as received him, which is Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So there's no works there mentioned whatsoever, only believe. Believe Amen. in Christ to receive him. And you have the right to become children of God, he says. One of the other promises uh, that God's grace gives us is also the promise of eternal security. Let's turn to chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. John chapter 10. We'll start with verses 22 and go through 30. Mm -hmm. 22, at the time the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? 
If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness to me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Amen. My Father has given them to me as greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Notice how God the Father gives us to Jesus, the Son of God. Notice how God the Father is greater than all and holds us in his hands. Um, we also can look and go, we are all familiar with the accounting of the Lord Jesus resurrecting Lazarus. Let's read in chapter 11 of John, verses 32 through 44. All right. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she was she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And so the Jews were saying, Behold, how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of him who was blind have kept this man also from dying? Jesus, therefore, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And so they removed the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hear, heardest me. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people standing around, I said it, that they may believe that thou didst send me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He who had died came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Do we see how much our Lord loves his own sheep? Um, don't miss Jesus' thankfulness to God the Father. How he was thankful in verse uh, 41. He said, Father, I thank thee that thou heardest me, and I know that thou hearest me always. So we... Can we be thankful as Jesus was being thankful to his father? To not only our fathers, but God the Father for giving us eternal life through his son, Jesus. Uh, are we thankful to the fathers here on earth that perhaps even raised us up in the faith? So for me, Pastor, I thank you as my spiritual leader all these years of raising me up in the faith. Amen. Thank you. Do we desire our children to be thankful to us for our guidance in the faith? When, in, when we do have children, or if you already have children, that's a good question. Are we concerned enough about their spiritual maturity to take the time to lead them in the faith in the scriptures? Finally, God's grace gives us all a new future to look forward to. Let's read chapters 11, verses 45 through 52. Many, therefore, of the Jews who had come to Mary and beheld what he had done believed in him, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men who believe in him And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you 
that one man should die for the people and that whole nation should not perish. Now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. Well, Jesus himself not only gave himself for the nation of Israel, but also for us all, the Gentiles. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter, chapter 15. Verses 6 through 17. And the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth and the Gentiles, or by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing, placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. Yep. Uh, continue on. And all the multitude kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating to what signs and wonders God had done through them along the Gentiles. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it, as it is written. After these things, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So, James, the half-brother of Jesus, tells us more of God than how he has a comprehensive plan for us, all his people. By God's grace, um, he's promised us this great future with Israel, alongside Israel, uh, that he's going to restore the nation of Israel, not only at this point in the future, but then also he brings us along as all the Gentile believers to be there beside Israel and to serve God with Israel in worshiping God and God alone in his grace. And then last, and finally, I'd like to conclude with a story from Charles Swindoll about God's grace. He, he writes, to many people, grace is nothing more than something to be said with heads bowed before dinner. But that idea, as simple and beautiful as it may be, is light years removed from the depth of meaning pre presented in scripture regarding grace. This biblical concept of grace is profound and its tentacles are both far reaching and life changing. Were we to study it for a full decade, we would not come close to plumbing its depths. I never knew Lewis Berry Schaefer, the founder of the seminary I attended. He had died a few years before I began my theological studies in 1959. Some of my mentors and professors, however, knew him well. Without exception, they still remembered him as a man of great grace. He was an articulate defender of the doctrine and an authentic model of its application through his adult life, especially during his latter years. I sincerely regret never having known Dr. Schaefer. I love the story of one of my mentors tells of the time when this dear man of God had concluded his final lecture on grace. It was a hot afternoon in Dallas, Texas, that spring day in 1952. The aging professor who taught that particular semester from a wheelchair mopped the perspiration from his brow. No one in the class moved as the session ended. It was as though the young theologians were, yeah, were basking in what they had heard 
awestruck with their professor's insights and enthusiasm about God's matchless grace. The gray-haired gentleman rolled his chair to the door, and as he flipped the light switch off, the class but spontaneously broke into thunderous applause. As the beloved theologian wiped away his tears, head bowed, he lifted one hand, gesturing them to stop. He had one closing remark as he looked across the room with a gent gentle smile. Amidst deafening silence, he spoke softly. Gentlemen, for over half my life, I've been studying this truth, and I am just beginning to discover what the grace of God is all about. Within a matter of three short months, the stately champion of grace was ushered in to the Lord's presence at the age of 81. How great God's amazing grace is. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.